to finish the homework. Uh, remember, uh, the example in this case is we want to understand what is the state of stress at depth for an unconventional formation in which the maximum horizontal stress, the vertical stress, and the minimum horizontal stress are not the same. And also, uh, some of those vary as a function of depth. Um, so we, we learned what, what is a tensor. Uh, we learned how to calculate a vertical stress. If you go to the undergraduate notes, you will see how to calculate pore pressure when there is overpressure. When there is a phenomenon which is called underconsolidation, uh, that if you have a, a rock with a very low permeability, the pore pressure is not going to be hydrostatic pore pressure, but it's going to be higher than that. And that usually happens when rocks are very, uh, very tight. So a lot of sediments come on top, and there is no time for the water to get out of the rock, and the water gets locked in at a higher pressure than it should be in hydrostatic pore pressure. If you follow the notes, you'll see how to calculate that. Actually, in this basin, there is quite a bit of overpressure. It's not necessarily due to that. Uh, in this case, it's a combination of that, but also there is a lot of overpressure because of hydrocarbon generation. When, when you get these rocks with lots of organic matter at the right depth, at the right temperature and pressure, oil and gas start to generate, and that elevates the, the pore pressure up. And that's why if you try to calculate pore pressure in this case with the depth that you get from SV, you will see it's much higher than what it should be in than with conditions of hydrostatic uh, pore pressure. Okay, so let's look one more time here and try to notice something very important. We learned so far, let me move this up a little bit, uh, and I'm going to put this one over here. Uh, we learn how to calculate and I'm going to make now this plot a little bit more realistic. Not, not that much realistic, but But those are some mountains over there, okay? This is the surface. This is a, a drilling rig. And uh, let me move this up. And I know that, uh, let me move a little bit more up. I know that this is part of, uh, in this case, we are in the, the Baca Muerta Formation in South America. So this is going to be the South American plate. And somewhere over here, there is going to be, so Chile is somewhere over here, very narrow country, and uh, well, very, very nice too. <laughs> uh, especially if you go to Patagonia to the south, it's very beautiful. Uh, this is going to be the Atlantic, uh, not the Atlantic, the Pacific plate. Sorry for that. <laughs> uh, I, I always get those, you know, uh, uh, confused. So this is the Pacific plate that is going underneath the South American plate. Uh, okay, so if we wanted to calculate the state of stress at this point, or determine that here we'll have vertical stress, here we'll have in this direction, and I'm going to explain why, the maximum principal stress. And perpendicular to the plane, we're going to have the minimum principal stress. We know how to calculate vertical stress, right? How do we calculate that? What was the equation for that? Rho bulk as a function of z, gravity 
differential z, right? Very easy. Uh, pore pressure, it's a little bit more difficult, okay? But we're, we're not, we're not going to get into that uh, right now. Hydrostatic pore pressure, but uh, sometimes, uh, many times, that's not the actual pore pressure. The question now is, what are those horizontal stresses? How do we calculate those? Uh, what, what is the value of those? Um, can we measure those values? And, uh, and the answer to that is that, that we don't know. We don't know what those are. And actually, it's that this, determining this value is a big unknown in geomechanics. Uh, there, there are several ways of measuring or trying to at least narrow down the range in which you think those are, or th those actually are in the subsurface, but uh, actually those are quite difficult measurements. Um, I I'm going to just tell you a little bit about that, or how to determine those, but I recommend that, that you go through my notes or uh, you read uh, Sobak's book about how to determine those in the field. You, you will find a lot more of information there. And, uh, and later when we cover uh, faulting and hydraulic fracturing, we'll, we'll see uh, more detail about uh, those two, okay? But for now, just, just as a brief overview, uh, I can tell you that the value of SH mean which is the minimum principal stress, or the least principal stress, is usually determined through hydraulic fracturing. Uh, basically, uh, you, probably you, you, let me move this out of the way. You, you may already see that if you were to do a hydraulic fracture in this place, the minimum, absolute minimum pressure that you need to open that fracture is the minimum principal stress. Why? Because nature is lazy and always tries to do the least amount of work. So a fracture will open always perpendicular to the minimum principal stress, which in this case, actually, I'm assuming it is this one, but it may not be that one, right? Uh, we'll, we'll go into, in a minute into that, but I'm assuming that this one is the minimum principal stress, then it will open like that. When your hydraulic fracture starts to open at that pressure, that's going to be related to the minimum principal stress. So if you read those tests of hydraulic fracturing, uh, you could determine what is the minimum principal stress. And we're going to see that later on, how to do that. Uh, second, you could also determine a minimum principal stress if you know the direction and the orientation of faults. We're going to cover that uh, later on. And, uh, but if you have uh, rocks break, when there is a lot of difference between the maximum principal stress, let's assume SV, and the minimum principal stress, which is, a, let's assume SH mean. When there is a large difference between those two, that's when rocks break in shear. And a fault is not other thing but a rock or an entire geological formation uh, breaking in shear. And we're going to see that uh, later on as well. And a third way of determining SH mean is with wellbore failure. When you drill a wellbore, um, I don't remember if I made this schematic or not, but... Uh, Let's make a schematic of a wellbore somewhere over here. If you look from the top, if we have a circular wellbore, if this is SH max coming in this direction, and this one is SH mean, let me make it a little bit bigger. As these stresses, the, the maximum stresses, try to go around the wellbore, uh, there's going to be a concentration of compressive stresses near this part of the wellbore, the wall of the wellbore, and that's going to create rock failure here. 
and also in conjugate directions here, which is going to create something which are called a web of breakouts. Ba basically, the rock at this position is going to break and it's going to fall in the, in the wellbore. And there's going to be like an empty cavity in that direction, at that location. If you have enough pressure inside the wellbore, which is going to be provided by the mud pressure, and that's too high compared to a combination of these two stresses, in addition to that, at 90 degrees from those wellbore uh, breakouts, you're going to have tensile failure. So let me do it in another color. And let me zoom up so it is clear. Here, we're going to have failure in shear with a lot of compression. And here, we're going to have failure in tension. We're going to see also uh, a, lo a lot more uh, about this in detail uh, later on, OK? But that's basically, these are just uh, you know, the, the main methods. There, there are some others to determine what is the value and what is the orientation of SH mean. That's another thing, right? Because here, we want to know the value, but also we want to know the orientation in which it is in this direction, in that one, in this one. We, we don't know that uh, a priori. And for SH max, you can determine those also either through faults or through world war failure. But actually, uh, hydraulic fraction is pretty good to determine this one. But we cannot use that to determine uh, that one, and that makes this one to have a much higher uncertainty. We're going to see that later on, too, all right? Uh, yes? But if you know where SH min and where SP are, don't you just automatically know where SH min is? You know the orientation. You don't know the value. You don't know the value. You know the orientation very well, but you don't know the value. Um, OK, so Let's see that in this example in South America um, that I, I have a schematic here. So these are the Andes. And uh, why did I draw SH max in this direction and not in this direction? Be and, and what about the subduction? It creates a lot of stress, right? So those two plates are coming, you know, converging into each other, and they are creating a lot of stress. So much stress that you know some of those rocks are are getting uh, up here and making mountains. So in this region, we have SH match, SH match, SH max, which is coming in this direction, and it is actually, if you look at this. it is actually higher than SV. There are some points and some location at some depths in which even SH max is higher than, of course, SH mean, but SH mean is also higher than SV. So we don't know the value of SH max and SH mean. And that's going to depend on the place and, uh, and many other factors. What we do know is that uh, there, are, there are just three possible cases. So uh, if we have S1 as a maximum principal stress, S2 as an intermediate, and S3 as a minimum principal stress, there is going to be a case in which SV is the maximum principal stress. Um, and we have SH max and SH min. This type of, uh, of combination, we're going to call it normal faulting. And this type of combination usually happens when you have 
a, a subsurface with very low tectonic strains, so this, they do not push too much in the horizontal direction, or even there may be a, a little bit of, uh, of expansion in the, in the lateral direction. And the, the name normal faulting is related to the type of shear faults or shear fractures that you're going to find in those uh, basins. And we're going to see in detail later on uh, why these are called like that. Uh, the second case is going to be a case in which the maximum principal stress is horizontal, the intermediate principal stress is vertical, and the minimum principal stress is horizontal too. And this is a case of strike, slip, faulting. Probably strike, slip uh, doesn't tell much to you right now what that means, but we're going to see that later on too. It means that the faults, they move along the strike, which is a line parallel to the intersection between the fault and a horizontal plane. And the third case is going to be a case in which both horizontal stresses are higher than the maximum principal uh, stress. And this is a case which is called uh, reverse, or some other people call it thr thrust faulting. Let's see quickly, uh, talking about faults right now, uh, it's going to take a lot of time. Uh, so we're going to do that later on. But something much easier to look at are uh, hydraulic fractures. So if we have a normal faulting regime, and I have the subsurface somewhere over here, and I have a wellbore, and this one is the direction of SH mean. And here I have SV, and SH max is going to be uh, perpendicular to the paper. Uh, what is going to be the orientation of a hydraulic fracture that I start at this point? Huh? Okay, but perpendic perpendicular to SH mean, that's the key, right? So a vector defines one plane. Perpendicular to S SH mean, because it's normal faulting, and this one is S3, it's going to be something like this, right? So let me try to draw that coming out of the, of the play of the paper. It's going to be something like that. Uh, remember that in this case, SH mean is equal to S3. Uh, what about if we have strike slip faulting. Again, we have similar wellbore going into a formation in which I have here SV, SH mean, and SH max. And this condition still holds. What is going to be the orientation of a, of a hydraulic fracture? The, the same? The same, right? A plane that comes out like that. Because it's always perpendicular to, to SH mean. And the third case in which we have reverse faulting. Now, I always forget to do that drilling rig over there. Wh which, which one is going to be the minimum principal stress now? Vertical, right? So SV is going to be equal to S3. 
um, what is uh, going to be the orientation of a hydraulic fracture now in this case? Let me complete the, the drawing here with SH mean, SH max, and SV. It's going to be perpendicular to SV, and now it's going to be something like this. It's going to be like a pancake, horizontal. And in this last case, if you do something like that, out of the horizontal wellbore, it will look like that. If you do it a, a little bit higher up over here, it will look like this. Notice that in those two cases, you're literally lifting the ground up. That's what you're doing. And, and, and now, I hope it becomes very clear that in order to lift the ground up, you need to overcome this stress, at least that stress with a pressure inside, inside the fracture. And uh, in, in these two cases, you don't need uh, uh, such a high pressure because the horizontal stress is less than the vertical stress. So you need a little bit less of uh, pressure in order to open that uh, fracture. But actually, it, it can get pretty close to that too. OK, so for now, we're just going uh, to, to accept that, that this is the case. And actually, for the homework, we know those values. So we're just going to work with those. Later on, we're going to find a solution and an explanation uh, and a model to determine these stresses as a function of the properties of the, of the rock. OK, uh, any questions so far? Yes, I mean. Uh, so you mean the, the hydraulic fracture orientation will only depend on which stress is the minimum stress? Yes, on S3. Uh, later on, we'll see that sometimes when S2 and S3, they, they get close to each other, you start to have some weird things, uh, hydraulic fracturing, fractures uh, branching more and going into other directions. Uh, but uh, ideally, if S3 is uh, much less than S2 and S1, you will have preferentially just uh, propagation on a plane perpendicular to, to S3. Okay, uh, any other question? In the plane of the propagation, yes. does, does, the or does the preferred direction have any, have any dependence on the other two stresses? So, for example, for the normal faulting, yeah. But uh, would the fracture prefer to go this way or go that way? Um, like this way or that way? Or yeah. this way or uh, yeah. up or down? Up or down. Uh, up, or, up or like to the side? Um, like, that to here? Yeah. Well, it, it will depend on the heterogeneity of the rock in this direction. So it won't only, so it won't only depend on the stress conditions and a lot of other, more, a lot more other things. Uh, it depends on a lot more of things, but the biggest thing that is going to condition hydraulic fracture propagation is stress. So uh, we're going to see later on that sometimes we have fracture barriers. For example, if SH mean were to uh, increase a lot here on the top and the bottom, if you have a very stiff cap rock, the hydraulic fracture is going to be contained in this direction. It's not going to propagate up or down. And, and the same is valid for uh, propagation in this direction and in that other direction. If you have like stiffer rock going uh, dipping into this direction, then probably it will tend to grow on the other direction. All right, okay, so uh, because we have three different values of stress and, and we, we, we need to develop some tools in order to uh, understand those in order to plot those easily uh, to when, when those vary as a function of space or as a function of time. All right? And that's what we're going to do right now. 
Uh, you guys are familiar with the Mohr circle, right? Uh, but are you familiar with the 3D Mohr circle? Well, that's what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about the 3D Mohr circle. So uh, you're going to see that it's much easier than what it looks. Uh, let's say that we have a tensor and that we have already calculated the principal stresses. So we put those principal stresses here in the diagonal. Uh, and further uh, later, we just uh, want to plot the, the tensor of effective stresses. Because uh, other than for hydraulic fracturing, uh, effective stresses are, are more important than the total stresses. So we'll get sigma here, and that's going to be S minus pore pressure times the identity tensor, which is just a matrix of ones. And this is going to be sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 3. All right. So what is the 3D Mohr circle? A 3D Mohr circle is just a way of plotting a tensor. Uh, let's say that I have a two-dimensional space x, y, and I want to plot a scalar, like pressure. Let's say that at the origin I have a wellbore, and the pressure is, say, 10. And in the far field, the pressure is 20. Like here, I know it's 20, and probably... Uh, well, let, let, let me do it. Oh, well, here's okay. Here's 20. Uh, let's say here it's 15, right? So I can plot. If, if this if this is a well where this is radial flow, I can plot contour lines of that uh, pressure uh, field, right? Very easy. You, you you can see that right away. So this is pressure. Um, what about if I want to plot a vector? How do you plot a vector? Just a little arrow, right? Exactly, and that's it. So if, if I'm closer to the wall board, very likely that vector is going to be bigger. I'm talking about the velocity vector. And as I, I get further away, it's going to be smaller, and it's going to be even smaller over there, right? And, and the same thing is going to be here, there. And it's, it's not way too difficult to plot, to plot a vector. How do you plot a tensor? Well, now now, now we, are, we are in trouble, right? So in, in order to plot a tensor, uh, you, you, you have to choose. You have to choose. Uh, Probably you could plot scalar, you could plot sigma 1 only, or you could plot sigma 3 only, or you could plot the direction of the principal stress sigma 1, or the direction of the principal stress sigma 3. Those are going to be vectors, right? Those are easy to, to plot. But if you want to fully plot a tensor, uh, it, that's, that's kind of... Uh, uh, not as easy as plotting here uh, just a point or, or some contour lines and some vectors. That requires some other, uh, um, other tools and uh, other ways of plotting that. And that's where the Mohr circle comes into the picture. Okay? A 3D Mohr circle is going to be a plot in which in the x-axis we plot the normal stress, usually the effective normal stress, and on the y-axis, uh, we plot the shear stress. Uh, what do we put now in the 3D Mohr circle? In the 3D Mohr circle, uh, say that I have this element at an arbitrary orientation where I have sigma 1, sigma 2, and 
sigma 3. What is the value of shear stress on these phases of the principal stresses? Zero, right? So that's by definition. By definition, it's a principal stress because there are no shear stresses on those phases. And if there are no shear stresses, that means that I can put all those values on the horizontal line. So here I'm going to have, let's say, sigma 3, sigma 2, and sigma 1. Those are the values of uh, the principal stresses with no shear stress. And now, you, you know the 2D more circle, right? So the 2D more circle is just a circle between principal stresses. So let me, uh, that's going to be uh, one more uh, of the more circles. Then I have these other two. There's going to be another more circle there. And between the combination of sigma 1 and sigma 3, I'm going to have another more circle. Let me try to fix this more circle like that. OK. So now I, I hope it, it, is, it is clear that, that we have uh, three circles in there. So we, we already know that each of these points is a possible state of stress, right? So if I were to know uh, what is the normal stress and the shear stress on this phase perpendicular to the direction of principal stress number one is that. Normal stress on this phase is sigma two, and shear stress is zero, so it's that point, and this other one is that point. Now, what, what are those what, what, are, what are those circles? Why, why uh, can we draw those, those circles? So the principal stresses are what are on, on the object. So as you change the direction, wouldn't your shear component be the projection of another, of a different principal stress onto your plane? Um, it will be a projection of a stress, but not, not, not necessarily a principal uh, stress. Uh, pro probably, probably we're meaning the same, but just with different words. Uh, those lines are all possible state of stresses. Uh, 